And that's why I think that there is really room for both. We need truly permissionless, proof of work backed internet money like Bitcoin. And we also need institutionally backed, regulated internet money like Ripple. I think it's good that there are projects like Ripple that are interfacing with regulators to lay groundwork for the industry. We need bridges between Web 2 and Web 3. People aren't going to just teleport there or something. Hi everyone, I'm Amy James, the co-inventor of Open Index Protocol, and welcome back to the What Kind of Internet Do You Want series. Please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel, and let's get into it. This video is part two of our three-part mini-series on the web monetization standard. In part one, we talked about why the web needs web monetization, and in part three, we'll get into how to use it and how it works with OIP and other Web3 protocols. In this episode, we're going to chat all about the technology and the history behind web monetization. For me, getting the full context around it really helped me to understand why the web monetization standard is such a big deal. So to do that, we have to start with Interledger. Interledger, or ILP v4, is a protocol to connect disconnected networks. I really like how it's named because I like protocol names that just say what they do in a straightforward way. Like HTTP is the hypertext transfer protocol and FTP is the file transfer protocol. And um, if you've seen the video where I explain how Open Index Protocol got its name, then you already know that it was the inventor of HTTP, Sir Tim Berners-Lee himself, that impressed upon me the importance of straightforward names for protocols. And if you haven't seen that, but you want to check it out, I will link it for you in the description. So Interledger is often described as a network of networks. It has no ledgers of its own. It's a protocol for interoperability between ledgers. So imagine you have a person who likes Bitcoin and they have a Bitcoin wallet and then somebody else isn't into Bitcoin and all they have is an Alipay account and that's how they want to receive money. What Interledger does is it's intended to solve the problem of how you get from Bitcoin to Alipay. Interledger is a well-known and well-funded project, but what I didn't know about it until I started doing research for the video is that it originally started in 2004 by a guy named Ryan Fuger. The Interledger protocol is really the culmination of more than a decade of research in decentralized payment protocols. The work started in 2004 by Ryan, but it's since been augmented by the development of Bitcoin and has involved numerous contributors since then. Stefan Thomas and Evan Schwartz are some of the most well-known recent contributors because they wrote the Interledger white paper in 2015. And since there have been so many phases to Interledger, I'm just going to focus on the most recent version because if I were to get into all of the iterations, this video would just be way too long. So the way the internet is designed and its relationship with the web is an excellent analogy to the design of the Interledger protocol and its relationship to the web monetization standard. It's not really an analogy. The Interledger protocol was in fact heavily inspired by the internet protocol because the internet does the same kind of thing, connecting a network of networks. If you're on a 4G mobile connection and I'm on ethernet, we can still FaceTime, right? But before Interledger, nothing that creates a network of networks has existed for payments. So if I'm on PayPal and you're on WeChat Pay, it would be difficult for us to send money. The builders of Interledger were inspired by internet protocols and how they bridge the gap between totally different kinds of networking technology, whether it's fiber, mobile phones, satellite, etc. In one of his talks, I heard Stefan Thomas mention that there had even been tests of the internet protocol using carrier pigeons that actually worked, which is just crazy but really illustrates the power 
of the flexibility inherent in the spec. So following the design of the internet protocol, Interledger breaks payments into tidy packets and handles the routing to find a path of liquidity that is available between the source of the payment and the destination of the payment. They call it penny switching and their reasons for using it are very similar to why TCPIP also breaks down data into small packets for transmission. Interestingly, the interledger builders came to this solution because of the issue of variability in payment size. Just like the internet where you don't want to send a big file download as a single packet because if it gets lost or aborts, it has to start completely over, which would be very inefficient. Payments are likewise broken into tiny packets instead. So with Interledger, one of the big issues that they faced before finding the penny switching solution of breaking everything into small packets was liquidity. If you have a path and you want to send a payment through the path, but it doesn't have enough liquidity to do that, then the payment wouldn't work. Also, I thought this was interesting. The exchange rate can vary based on the size of the payment. So if you are trying to find the cheapest path in terms of exchange rates, you'd likely end up with distinct paths. Small payments would use certain paths, large payments would use different paths, and the routing table would get more complicated. So having a consistent small packet size was the answer to a lot of problems that earlier iterations of the protocol had. With penny switching, they can assume a fixed number for the exchange rate. And since the packets are all small, they just have a flat rate. And liquidity becomes much less of an issue because if you exhaust the liquidity on some path, the next packet will just take a different path. And similar to how the internet is designed in layers where the internet protocol connects networks and the web protocol allows content to be linked over these connected networks, interledger and web monetization are designed to work in layers as well. Interledger connects disconnected ledgers and the web monetization standard allows payments to be routed between these ledgers. Web monetization uses payment pointers the way that the web uses links. What made the web special was the simplicity of its design. By using a simple ahref tag, links from one site to another could be made and from that a hyper-connected web was born with now almost 2 billion sites. The web monetization standard is similarly simple. A payment pointer is like an ahref tag. So by adding a payment pointer to a web page, the web page or content creator can easily receive payments directly over the interledger protocol. That payment pointer resolves to an HTTPS URL. Think of payment pointers like an email address or like your checking account routing number. It's a meta tag that says this website monetizes with this wallet. For the crypto folks thinking of it in crypto terms, a payment pointer is the public key for your interledger wallet. A draft of the web monetization standard has been published through a W3C community group, but it's not yet a W3C standard, nor is it on the standards track, although I believe that is their intention should it have the necessary support. A potential downside to the design that stood out to me is that the web monetization standard depends on using Interledger, which is built on Ripple, and it's not made to work with other blockchain interconnect approaches like Polkadot or Cosmos. And that makes sense because those protocols do similar things to interledger and so making them compatible with each other adds a whole other layer of complexity okay so how it works is that ripple can work without interledger but interledger cannot work without ripple it's one of those all prunes are plums but not all plums are prunes kind of thing and web monetization is built on interledger so it also relies on ripple and while it will 
definitely be a multi-blockchain future, there will be certain kinds of protocols that are winner take all, while others will have several competitors. The internet is the best example of winner take all. We all use the same protocol to get on the internet. If instead we used many different protocols, the result would be many smaller, less powerful internets. With protocols for payments, it's not necessarily winner take all. We are used to having several payment options that have different features. For example, there are several major credit card companies, there's Swift, Fedwire, ACH, and we choose between them based on the features they offer for a specific type of transaction. So for instance, I personally like to buy certain things with a credit card instead of a debit card because of the purchase protection, but I also prefer to use ACH for our auto pays. So if I lose my card, I don't have to set it all up again. And with payments, there is no downside to having multiple options like there are with the internet protocol example. If anything, it benefits users to have options and competition in the payment space. It seems to me like blockchain connect protocols like Interledger, Polkadot, and Cosmos will end up being more along the lines of payments where there's not one winner. So we may end up having the web monetization standard built on Interledger and a different version of it for Polkadot or Cosmos or whichever blockchain interconnect projects ultimately went out. At least right now, it doesn't look like the web monetization standard will be interoperable with other blockchain connect networks, although perhaps that could change. And I just want to say a quick word about the web monetization standard relying on Ripple because I guess I've just spent enough time with the hardcore decentralization and permissionless purists to have like absorbed their skepticism by osmosis or something. The thing about Ripple is that it's brilliantly designed to be as efficient as possible within the boundaries of the legal system that it operates in. The participants aren't independent nodes that can do anything they want, like with Bitcoin. This isn't to say that Bitcoin is for criminals, far from it. It's more a criticism of governments. Ripple is as trustworthy as the government in which it's operating because the gateways have to do whatever the government requires. If they decide that it's illegal to sell alpaca wool socks on the internet, Ripple gateways would have to stop those transactions. In my opinion, it's a question of trade-offs. And that's why I think that there is really room for both. We need truly permissionless, proof of work backed internet money like Bitcoin. And we also need institutionally backed, regulated internet money like Ripple. I think it's good that there are projects like Ripple that are interfacing with regulators to lay groundwork for the industry. We need bridges between Web 2 and Web 3. People aren't going to just teleport there or something. It's up to those of us building Web 3 to make onboarding paths for users and regulation compliance is an important part of that work. Okay, phew. we've gotten pretty into the weeds in this one, but to see why web monetization holds such promise for monetizing content and information online, I thought we really needed to understand the history and technology behind it. So in part three, we will look at how to use it. It's really quite easy. And we will talk about how it works interoperably with OIP and other Web3 protocols. If you have thoughts about web monetization or questions about how you can use it as a creator, leave a comment below or hit me up on Twitter or Instagram at Amy of Alexandria and follow the channel at Open Index Proto. Don't forget to smash the like button and subscribe to the channel and share the video. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.